Welcome, fellow sciencers. I am Aaron Freeman, co-host of the Chicago Brain Buddies, along with Professor Peggy Mason, and we are here joined by Dr. Maria Weber to talk about quantum neurobiology, planetary magnetism, and all kinds of fun stuff. Welcome! <laughs> So why are we doing this? Yes. Um, you, you expect me to remember? Uh, <laughs> I think it's because I saw that that article on mallards, right? Yes, that, that's what you told me. Okay, so we see these article on mallards, and and you know, okay, one of those plaguing questions is how all of these water birds land without running in, in into each other, right? They all landing. First of all, they're going in the right direction, and second of all, they're going at the right inclination. And how does that happen? And then somebody figured out that, in fact, they all land, different water bird species land at a different uh, relationship to magnetic north. And this is another one of those functions that we see commonly in birds, but also in other taxa, where they are acting um, with, in a way that makes it obvious to us that they can sense magnetic north. And then we went down a rabbit hole. That's it. And I actually uh -huh. blame you for the rabbit hole. I, would, you, I blame you totally for the rabbit hole. No. I was minding my own business, not even thinking about this mess. Yeah, yeah. But I got the biology part, but you went down the no. quantum rabbit hole. We'll get to the quantum stuff, okay. which is so weird, but. Speaking of Magnetic North, we have here someone who actually knows, knows quite a bit about, about Magnetic North. Unlike us. That's right, Dr. Marie Weber. Tell us about it. Okay, well, when we talk about magnetic fields, well, first of all, um, the Earth has a, a large-scale magnetic field, and so do stars. I study, specifically on my day-to-day -day job, the magnetic field of the sun, and it turns out that the processes that create the sun's magnetic field are not too terribly different from the process that processes that create the Earth's magnetic field. So maybe I'll get more to that. Does the sun bit. have iron in it? No, the sun is made only of hot gas, mostly hydrogen and helium. But it is so hot that some of the electrons can separate from the nucleus of the atom, and that allows these electrons to move freely around. And when you have a bunch of sloshing, spinning, freely moving electrons, you get a current, electricity. And as a byproduct, you get very strong magnetic fields. So that's how it works in the sun. In the Earth, the Earth is like, uh, the Earth's interior is like a rocky, molten, liquidy thing. And so it's not hot gas, but it's the motion of this molten liquid that when you stir it up, whenever you rotate it, whenever it moves because it's hot and convecting, it can also generate an electric current which thereby generates a large scale magnetic field. So, <laughs> so are, we trend, are we sucking in all the metal in the solar system? No. no. <laughs> the magnetic field isn't that strong. It's not like, you know, a crazy magnet. Uh, it is magnetic, but it's not strong enough to, like, suck in other magnetic-y things. So yeah. one of the reasons why I wanted to talk about the magnetic north before we got into the biology part was because there's a new story in Twitterland, um, <laughs> which I bizarrely participate in, who would have thought, but um, that it's been traveling, we're having a little seesaw with Russia, mm -hmm. back and forth, you know, and, and Magnetic so, North, you mean? Yeah, Magnetic North is moving. What? It's on the move. Everybody wants and, to get And so, you know, I mean, it's actually a few feet of, yeah, is like, it a few feet a year? Um, it's a few I don't inches, know, it's I don't a few know the something a year. It's, it's quite a bit, so, like, do the, Animals actually have to accommodate for this change? I mean, yeah, I guess they would have to, right? So this image that I have behind me here is a picture that shows how the Earth's magnetic north has been moving over time, and my eyeballs aren't good enough to can really you, can see. Can you but, try and focus that? Um, but in general, the magnetic north has been sort of meandering around from somewhere over here into now it's somewhere <coughs> right here, so that's the north the North Geomagnetic North Pole. Magnetic North is not at the North Pole? Sorry? Magnetic North is not at it the North not. Pole? It is not. No, Magnetic North moves around. <laughs> and you, yeah, you can see the trajectory that it's taking here. So they expect in 2020 it's going to be somewhere here. About right now it's somewhere here. But in like 1994 it was right there. So this is like above Canada. Um, 
Yeah, so it, it does move around. So and why it, is it close to but not on the North Pole? Oh, okay. Well, <coughs> the, the magnetic field isn't really bound by, by the, what we call the geographic North Pole. Um, the magnetic, the large scale magnetic field that we see, what we classify as magnetic north, is created by the motion of that liquid metal inside the Earth's interior. And different parts of it move at different speeds at different times, and um, the motion of that over time is what can shift the, the large scale magnetic North Pole over time. So it's an effect of the way that the molten liquid inside the Earth's interior is moving around. It's a process of what we call a dynamo, and a dynamo is any process that creates magnetic fields within planetary bodies. So so is the idea so the other thing that was surprising to me is that South Pole, very boring, sits in one place, doesn't move. Well it does I mean, move. Is, <laughs> is that because the, the molten stuff is not so close to the surface? Uh, no, it it's not necessarily about depth. It's just about the way in which it moves. Um, if it's faster or slower or they can make little vortices, like little swirling um, eddies, you know, when you play to, in a pool and you move around, you see little swirling bits. It, different things like that can pop up in different places in the interior of, of, of the Earth and the interior of the Sun, and that can affect the magnetic field overall. So it's, it's really just the, the way that the liquid inside the, the Earth is choosing to move. Yeah. So how do we, why do we think that birds are using magnetic north? We think this for a variety of reasons. One is that if you impose a really strong magnetic field on animals, it will, it will shift their behavior. So for example, if you take uh, salmon, they will, they will um, <coughs> swim up east-west. If you shift their magnetic field 90 degrees, they go north-south. <coughs> you know, there's a, I don't know, have you, do you, you know what the cone that they use to find, to tell that birds uh, are traveling in magnetic north, sensing it? There's this really wonderful contraption. It's a, a metal box, and then there's a cone. And at the bottom of the cone is a little uh, um, inkwell, a bunch of uh, dye. And, there's a, so, and, they, and they put a magnet at one end of the box, and they see if the bird tries to fly in that direction. And the path that the bird takes is revealed by the, 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 the marking, the die markings on the cone. It's like an old experiment. It's an old, yeah. old but I love clever kind of clever yeah, things. Yeah. Yeah. Old but clever than the well, I mean, And then so. in, in, in the terms of, say, the, the Mallard study, what they did was they studied the angle of, of landing. And so. And this is a pretty big study. They looked at this, a lot of birds. Thousands and thousands of birds, most of them were mallards, I think 12, 14,000 mallards, something like that. Yeah. There's a lot of landings that they were looking at, and, and they find that, that almost all of them were north, and within, then within, within 20 degrees. Within 20? 20. It was, I don't know, 75, 80% were within 20 degrees of north, a bunch of them were within very close to south, and there was almost nothing either way. So you can imagine, if you're going to tell north, it's, it is problematic to tell south. South is the closest to north, <laughs> and, um, and there may be some mix up there, but we can talk a little bit about how animals may tell north from south. Um, well, let's. <laughs> okay. I bet you well, there's some neurobiology. So, so then there's the other one that did the same kind of observational study was these red foxes. And I think the red foxes story is su super cool. So it was, what is the angle of attack that they pounce on their prey? So if it's a, a lighted area and there's not much brush, they pounce in whichever direction the prey is. But if there's a lot of brush or there's snow and you basically can't use vision, because you can't see the little mouse, huh. they pounce north, north, south. Wherever the and mouse is. They, they line themselves up to, so <coughs> that they will pounce at north. And they line themselves up to pounce at a certain angle. 
And the combination of that means that they will go a certain distance at that certain angle. And they'll hit, and so, you know, they're trying to go into the snow, they have to go at, a, at, at this prescribed angle. It's as though you were walking around with a laser uh, pointer on your head that's sort of aimed down. And when that matches where the animal is, then you pounce. Because then your pounce, if it's stereotyped, will land on the prey. And that's super cool. Um, and what's interesting is when they did it in the north direction, they had, they were almost always successful. When they did it in the south direction, they were also successful, a little bit less. And when they did it anywhere else in the uh, compass, uh, they, they didn't get the mouse. So, okay. so this is a, you know, this is something that is useful to them. Um, and, and it's cool. So. So how do they tell north from south? The idea that I understand. Yeah, can I say one thing? Yeah. What's really fun here, we're gonna watch, she's about to tell us how the mechanism by which animals can send north to south. We're gonna watch Peggy Mason go right up to the edge of what she knows. Is that fair? Oh yeah. <laughs> you know what, here it is. We're about to see the edge of what Peggy can tell us. How do, you, how do you know that? Because I, well, it was the, the edge of what you claim to know when you talk to me. <laughs> How's that? So the idea is... About this topic. I mean, there are many other things she does. I don't mean to... The idea is that they sense... They, it's not just that they sense the magnetic field. And when they sense the magnetic field, they're sensing the axis. The axis of the magnetic field. So, that, so, you know, at the surface, the magnetic field is coming off the North Pole and coming down like this. And they're sensing that angle, not the polarity. They don't sense plus minus. Um, and what they do is they sense that angle and they have another ability called the vestibular sense, which we all have, in fact, almost all animals have, um, which sen senses gravity. And what they're calculating somehow is the angle between the Earth's, uh, mag the, the angle of the magnetic field and the, um, and, and gravity and so if you're facing north that's an acute angle and if they're facing south it's a very wide angle it's a much wider angle so that's kind of cool there too and yeah. so and so in the birds little retinas there's a particular protein well before we get to our, our little favorite protein that we're going to spend a lot of time on <laughs> which i'm going to uh, uh. yeah right <laughs> this is where we shove it over the <laughs> physicist here okay. I'll try. before we get to that one before we get to that you, you know there was a there's a long history i remember when i was in school the favorite idea was to search for a little bit of of iron in a bird brain and they were they searched deep in the brain and then there was this idea that there's on the top of the um bird beak uh there there's a collection of of uh ferric oxide uh iron oxide and and that was a popular notion for how, how birds sense magnetic north yeah and so the idea was that it would it would move with the magnetic field and then that would move the actual cell and then there was a mechanoreceptor that sensed the movement of the cell and then you it was basically you're you're sensing the movement of the compass and the compass is the little deposit of iron that seems to have fallen completely out of favor so people have decided that those the cells that 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 sent that have the iron deposits are actually macrophages, not a what? So what? I don't know. They're part of the immune system. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> don't worry about it. Yeah. Pay no attention to the immune Pay system. Pay no attention. <laughs> Man behind the curtain. I understand. Um. So yeah, it's part of the immune system, not a sensory cell, not hooked up to to the nervous system in any way. So, from what I can tell. And I could be wrong here, but from what I can tell, uh, that idea that we have little a little pocket of iron that's that's moving around like a compass um, is out of favor. And what is in favor is um, cytochromes and the 
lovely in cryptograms. Cryptograms, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Cryptograms and the lovely. What's a cryptogram? What is that? What is that? Okay, sure. we'll get back to that. But you know, I'm going to shove this over to Maria <laughs> very soon because the cryptograms do this through a mechanism that's called quantum entanglement. <laughs> But cryptochromes are a very cool group of molecules. They were first um, discovered in plants because they are responsible for DNA repair. Now, if you think about it, why do you need DNA repair? You need DNA repair when there's a lot of energy. Where's there a lot of energy? Where there's a lot of light. So plants have all these proteins that are exposed to a lot of light a lot of UV light, a lot of high energy light, and it breaks down the DNA. And what you really want is something that's gonna fix that DNA. So these DNA repair molecules, and it turns out that this class of DNA repair molecules had a sensitivity to light, to low wavelength light. So that low wavelength has more energy than, than long wavelength. And, and so, what then became apparent was that this group of molecules, the structure of it evolved over time and is found in bacteria, is found in, in animals as well as plants. And in animals, it has lost its DNA repair abilities, but it has retained this ability to um, sense light. And, and so uh, then everyone sort of, threw up their hands, but what has become apparent is that it is responsible, it appears to be responsible for detecting uh, the magnetic sense in most animals. That is the most popular view for, um, and that it sits in the retina. It's a little bit complicated because even though it doesn't have a DNA repair uh, job anymore it still has a job as part of our clock as you may remember we all have a clock so even in the in the absence of any cues we go we we free run if we were in constant light or constant darkness we would free run at about 24 hours a little over 24 hours a day different animals have different periods but everyone has this rhythm that is close to not exactly but close to the, um, the sun's or the earth's uh, rotation. And, and, and so to make that, that internal clock that's always going, you need cryptochrome. So when you delete the cryptochrome, you delete the magnetic sense, but you also delete the clock. And so its functions are, um, it's been, it hasn't been the easiest thing to, to disentangle, shall we say. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that, let me just that before we get, get it, because this, yeah. this phenomenon occur, apparently occurs because of quantum entanglement. Anyone ever heard of quantum entanglement? Oh. Good. Anybody? Yeah, well, if, if, you, if you feel like jumping up yeah, here and telling us. Yeah, <laughs> oh, I'd love to hear it. Just, just, I mean, no, no one really understands. Is it fair to say that no one really understands it? If you, no one really understands quantum physics, not even. Okay. <laughs> quantum uh, physics. Well, so no one, but I mean, just say it. If you, if you want to offer, it'd be amusing. We'd love to hear what your thoughts, the, your description, your favorite description of quantum entanglement. She's going, no, no, no. Anybody want to offer a... Uh, it'd be a cool experiment to yeah. find out. <laughs> well, what do you know at all about it? Yes. Hang on one second here. We're going to get a mic to you right there. Okay. Uh, is that when you have two corks on opposite sides of the earth, and if you look at one, then the other one says, hello, like, well, you're looking at it, too? Ah, ah. So, yeah, that, that's, that's um, a very good description uh, Anybody of, else? of what's going on there. Yeah. Wait, hang on, hang on one second. Then we'll Sasha is on her way to you. <laughs> they say those two particles could be anywhere in the universe. And... Uh, it happens, they don't know if it goes at the speed of light or beyond the speed of light. It's one of the reasons, Einstein hated that, right? Yeah, it's hard to explain because we think things must travel at the speed of light and yet... And nothing can go faster. Right. Well, yes, exactly. Nothing can go faster than the speed of light, yeah. Any other quantum, just before you get it, anybody else got a quick description or any factoid about quantum entanglement? 
Okay. Uh, okay. What the heck are we talking about? So what I what I actually just learned is that quantum entanglement has a role beyond cryptograms. <laughs> Which I didn't realize. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Being very focused on, <laughs> on neuroscience, of course. There are, you know, ways you could c possibly use crypto, uh, um, quantum entanglement to uh, do computing or to um, to uh, to transfer information over long distances. But that's that's a different story. <laughs> um, but but to talk about quantum entanglement, what exactly is it? So you you got very a very very good description. Yeah. Um, so, uh, how I think about it, okay, so let's imagine two fundamental particles. In my case, I'm going to imagine two electrons. My electrons are entangled. And that means that I cannot describe my electrons individually, but I can describe them together as a pair. And so, if I know information about the state or properties of one of these electrons, I immediately know information about the state or the property of the other electron. And in the same way, if I were to be able to change the properties of one of the electrons, the other one would immediately know about it and, and um, have a corresponding change as well. And this happens um, regardless of if the two particles can see each other. It happens regardless of how far apart they're separated. So yeah. So can I, I mean, so it, it sounds like you're saying like, if it's you and me, mm -hmm. neither, of us, uh, might, neither of us might have a gender until we figured out what yours was, and then that would tell you what mine was. You got it. Yeah, exactly. So I could be, oh, I could be, right? I could be one of two things. I could be up or down. This is how we talk about electrons. They could be have a spin up or spin down. I could be either up or down. And until you measure me, you won't know which one I am. And once you measure me, and if I'm up, then we know that you're probably down. Yeah. That don't make no damn sense, man. Huh? <laughs> Unless he's up, uh, which, which is been, the other way. Who you measure first, right? Uh, well, depending on who you measure first will also make a difference on, on the other. Wh whatever you measure, uh, there's a corresponding change and then you can measure, you, you would immediately know the answer to what the other one would be. So entanglement, how does something get entangled? Are they like kind of wandering around and have an affinity, particles that have an affinity for each other? Hey, you're a good looking electron there, bro! <laughs> <laughs> um, so generally you have to have some event that occurs that um, creates either two electrons at the same, well, I'm, I'm just gonna talk about an electron as my fundamental particle, that creates two particles at the same time that are somehow linked to each other. Maybe you create them at the same time, or there's an event that forces two, two particles to be linked to each other in some way, an entangled um, state. So now in the, case, in the case of our birds, mm -hmm. how might that be happening? So we're inside the bird retina, and we're mucking about with our cryptochromes. Yes. So some, some, some light hits our cryptochrome, yes, and, and it, somehow... It has to be light of a blue color, specifically. Uh, so that's an important part about the cryptochrome. Blue light coming into the bird's eye hits the cryptochrome, and it energizes or excites the cryptochrome, and that excites... Wait, the whole, or just the cryptochrome well, with the electrons uh, within it? it the, uh, uh, a particular electron okay. on a molecule that exists within the cryptochrome protein. And this uh, electron is so excited that it jumps from the molecule that it's sitting on to a neighboring molecule. And you spontaneously or instantaneously create something called a free radical pair. So a free radical is a molecule with an unpaired electron. So now you have two molecules, each with an unpaired electron. But because these were created at the same time by the same event, these molecules are now linked quantumly. So they're, they're entangled. Quantumly entangled. Yes. Yes. Okay, I got it. I got it. So you had you had you have to have this one event that occurs at the same time to to create these these molecules at, at the same time to make them entangled. All right, so I, I'm sort of with you. We got the, we're in the cryptochrome. The light hits; it knocks one of the molecules. Uh, one of the uh, electrons. Free, one of the electrons. I mean, creates a free radical pair. Yes. So, but I, as I understand it, the birds somehow perceive this. How could that be? Okay, so then there's another step here that happens. So, because the molecules are entangled with each other. This also makes them more strongly susceptible to the effects of magnetism, or they feel more strongly the surrounding magnetic field, the Earth's magnetic field. 
And the magnetic field affects uh, the entanglement states, how the uh, molecules are correlated or linked to each other. And the magnetic field can force the pairs to be entangled for a longer amount of time, or it can force the pairs to change their states in corresponding ways. And that's a result of the magnetic field interacting with these um, entangled molecules. Now, so at that point, you then need to go back to biology, because yes. now there has to be a way in which that <laughs> um, sensitivity and that reaction to the magnetic field gets translated into an increased response. Do we have that picture in the famous, the famous the bird thing? The uh, bird? Yeah. How birds may be seeing this. That's a good little illustration. Yeah, I think it's, it's there. Yeah, that's yes. It. So, so the idea would be that if you're, if the magnetic field is hitting your cryptochromes just so, they are conferring to their parent neuron a little extra juice. <laughs> and so that's now, exactly instead of just seeing what you see, you see. It's as though there's a, I mean, as though there's a spotlight in the area that is north, or there's a, or the whole thing glows only when you're pointing north. Something along those lines is is what we think is going on. So this is a so it's not it's not going to be a. There are no photoreceptors that we know of that have only cryptochrome. They have cryptochrome in something else. So that the cryptochrome is only augmenting, facilitating the response to the something else, the other light. So now when you say that the, the, the entangled electrons are more sensitive to the magnetic field, we just have to accept that, right? Because there's not a why that happens, or uh, is there a why? Well, you could do some math. <laughs> Oh, we've accepted it. And you, can, right. you can make some diagrams and you can show yourself um, that, that uh, the effects of the magnetic field force the uh, entangled pairs to react in a certain way. And um, that reaction, how they react, how long they react, and how long they stay entangled. Because the entanglement doesn't last forever. The entanglement only lasts for a, something like a, a, a thousandth of a second or something like this. It's very quick. And so the magnetic fields can also change how long this happens, change the molecules a little bit in that way. Uh, and then that information gets transferred like, somehow through biology <laughs> to the bird brain. But, but there's a whole lot of photons coming at us too. I mean, sure, not, I mean, yeah. It's not like so, there's like one. Right, so these things, I mean, I don't know like the frequency, how often these things are happening, but probably all the time, I expect. Yeah, I mean, but, I mean, yeah. The cryptochromes yeah. are in the blue are, are in the, I'm sorry, in the short wavelength. We like to actually say short wavelength rather than blue because blue is actually only in the brain, not out there. Mm -hmm. uh, photons are not, not blue or red. Uh, so the short wavelength cones, which are the least numerous of the cones, and cones are less numerous than rods, so it's a pretty small... Cones and rods? Cones and rods are two different photoreceptors that the classic types of photoreceptors that sense... Um, cones sense things in, in brightish lights. If you can see colors, then you're using your cones. If you can only see dark and light, uh, dark and, you know, different shades of, of black and white, then you're using your rods. So, you know, at nighttime, you don't know what color the car is because you can't tell color. That's rod vision. So the the cryptochromes appear to be in the short wavelength cones. There are actually three different types of cones, short, medium, and, and long wave cones, and the short wavelength ones are the ones that contain the cryptochromes. So the, one of the things that I think is really interesting about, well, first of all, everybody clear? They all got this figured out? <laughs> yes, please. Sure. Well, hold on, hang on. Wait, wait till Sasha comes to you. So do I take it from this slide that superimposed over this bird's vision is a heads-up display with a sort of gradient, <laughs> gradient horizon that indicates north if it's balanced and off to the left and right is northwest or northeast? Is that what you suspect is going on? I, I mean, I think that this is a depiction and it could be anything close to that, anything in that uh, basic framework, it could be a spot, it could be that the whole field gets brighter, 
Um, or it could be that the horizon gets brighter. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that we know the specifics. But, and, and it's probably a little more subtle than that. Uh, you can detect really subtle changes perceptually. You will learn to learn to detect subtle changes with enough practice. And in fact, do you want to mention? Yes. Even so, so what do you think about, do you, do you think you have a magnetic sense? Does anyone here think they can tell magnetic north? Who's got a great sense of direction? Yeah. <laughs> Good sense of, okay, great sense so of direction. So in, okay. inside, could you tell which? No. So there's, there's, there's a couple pieces of evidence or a couple pieces of data that I'll, I'll share with you and you can make your own decision as to whether you think we have it. First of all, we have one cryptochrome. It's CRY2. There's CRY1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, we have cry two. Um, so the first piece of evidence is, is actually linguistic. And this comes from Leah Borditsky, who's a really, really interesting um, linguist. Uh, and she described a, a group of people in the South Pacific where they don't use the words left and right. They use the words south, east west and north. So they say, well, the person to my east, which I don't know that that's you, but I don't know which direction that is. It, then um, it is, you're right. Uh, but you know, the person to my east is so-and-so, and then you, you move them around, and now that's the person to their, you know, we could all move together, and now that would be the person to my north or whatever. And, um, and so that is very suggestive that people have that kind of a sense. The second piece of, uh, uh, of data I would share with you is one that was shared, to, shared with me by a um, graduate student of mine, Thad Brink. He's, he's now um, at Medtronic. And he told me about a, a study, and it turns out Aaron found the study, thank you Aaron, um, by a man named Frank Schumann. And what he did was he made these belts where each and there were all these sensors, and wherever you were, fate, wherever north was on you, the sensor would be activated, and it would buzz your skin. So you wear this belt, and then for two, two weeks or three weeks or whatever, you always are getting buzzed where magnetic north is. At the end of that period, they said, you know, how how, how does it work? And and they could detect magnetic north better than chance. Um, they also described it as having a more ordered and larger spatial sense, which I thought was kind of interesting. Anyway, so he did that on a pilot of four people, and it worked. And then he thought, oh, well, this would be so useful for blind people. So he got a person who had been blind from birth and he tried it and it didn't work. And his conclusion was, oh, I'm wrong. It doesn't work because, but my conclusion is, oh, he's right because this person doesn't have cryptochromes. And that's why it didn't work. Okay. Now, you know, there, there, there are a lot of ways to, to follow that up and Five people, four of whom are sighted and one of whom is blind, is not a is not enough of anything to to, to tell us something. But I think it's a very intriguing idea. Dr. Weber, as I understand it, this whole quantum, a lot of this quantum stuff, uh, particularly the entanglement, shouldn't happen in biology. Well. Um I don't know if we would say it shouldn't happen. <laughs> it, we find that it does, and that's weird, I guess. <laughs> okay, um, that's what it meant. I've, I've learned over many years that you should never say that something shouldn't happen in nature or in space because it probably will happen, and, and you have to find a reason to explain it. But so, yeah, so I was thinking about this a little bit. And so when we see a bird or whatever, we look at a brain of some animal, we're seeing it macroscopically. We see the whole thing, we see it as like the squishy, wet, kind of warm mess. 
But the particles do not see it that way, right? The particles are these little tiny things, and on their level, there's a lot of space between individuals, and they're not feel they're they're on a microscopic quantum scale. And so they're not feeling the wet, squishy stuff. They're seeing a lot of empty space and a lot of things zipping around. And so their world is a little bit different than the world that we but see. But they're at the same time, they're also feeling this very macro. Right field so they that can, is coming from the North Pole that is way, way bigger than my brain or your brain or the squirrel brain or uh, so so they're they're sort of got a foot in each exactly in each world. So in in inside a living thing you cannot, you know, isolate the quantum effects from the environment. Yeah. Right? But we can in a lab, kind of. And so it's hard for us to try to replicate some of these things happening in living systems on the quantum level in the lab. And I guess part of it's because we're missing out on something important about the macro scale, perhaps. Well, there's also the quantum effects, uh, what do they call it, decohere, that the effects, what, is it, what am I talking about? Yeah, so <laughs> if, you, if you say that in, entanglement decoheres, I guess, that means that the entanglement state, state breaks. So particles don't stay entangled for forever. Um, they just have a short time period over which they're, they're uh, entangled. So. Let's, in the particular case of within the cryptochrome, they can stay entangled for maybe up to a thousandth of a second. Um, and then in, in the lab, you can achieve different time scales, but I don't know, you know the exact numbers on that. So can I say, that, so when we talk about quantum, we, as I understand it, we mean it as opposed to classical me uh, mechanics. The physics. Sure, yeah. So what is the, what's the difference between quantum, classical physics and quantum physics? Um, so, I guess one example of um, classical physics that I like, the, the, the difference between classical and quantum physics, comes from um, something called the double slit experiment. Wait, how many people have heard of the double slit experiment? Some of you. Okay. Okay. What? So in the double slit experiment, let's, uh, you, have, you have two empty slits here. And then uh, behind that, you have a screen. Like there's a wall with two slits cut in it. Yeah, and then behind that, you have a screen. And then on one side, you have, um, let's say, a laser. Let's say a laser shooting uh, photons at these double slits. Um, but uh, first, let's start by the, the classical representation. Instead of shooting photons, photons are like individual packets of light. That's one way you could think about a photon. Instead of shooting packets of light at these double slits, let's shoot a ping pong ball at these double slits. At the wall with the two slits cut in it. Yes. Right. So if you shoot a ping pong ball, the ping pong ball only has one choice, one way to go. It will go through one particular uh, slit or the other, whichever way I'm pointing it. Or bang against the wall. Or, or bang against the wall, right. If it, if it finds its trajectory is aimed for the point where there's no empty slit there. Right. Uh, so that's a classical description. And it would leave a mark on the screen behind it. It would leave a mark on the screen behind it only if its trajectory was perfectly aligned to pass through that empty slit and hit the wall behind. But... Are we all clear on that, what she's talking about? So leave imagine ping pong okay. balls, throwing yeah. them, okay. and only a few of them get through the hole that's open. All right. But... And then make it sort of a sloppy, two sloppy cylinders on the screen behind maybe, Imagine like you're paintballing or something. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> and your paintball makes a splat on the wall. But now, instead of these ping pong balls, we have photons, these packets of light. But the weird thing about quantum mechanics is that the photon actually uh, can take both paths at the well, same I, can time. I, can I say something? Mm -hmm. Because as opposed to the ping pong balls, if you had like water going through, like if you just like slashed a bunch of water going through, when the, the water would, the, the waves of water would go through both slits. Yes. And form an interference pattern on the other side yes. of the slit. Yes, sure. So, yeah. yeah, so uh, imagine you were like in a, in a lake and you are skipping stones, you drop a stone in there, and you see ripples appear on the surface. Yeah, you create these interference so patterns. So the wave would go through both slits and yeah. have an interference pattern on the other side. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, yes. Um, so now, in, in the quantum mechanics world, we have a photon, and the photon actually can go through both slits, can it can choose both paths to go through the, the slit at the same time. 
So I can choose both paths, go through, and then on the wall behind, we won't see just one spot where it came through. We'll see the sort of ripple pattern of interference. Uh, because what? It I know what to do. You just set up a camera to see which slit it went through, and Bob's your uncle. No. <laughs> it turns out that quantum mechanics things don't like you to look at them, actually. So if you, if you, so, so one thing you might, yes, one thing you could try is to put a detector on one, behind one of those empty slits there to try to catch one of the photons. But whenever you do that, um, you don't create this interference pattern anymore, so. You mean if oh, you sorry. look, it decides which one, it decides to go through one slit or another, depending on whether or not you're looking at it? Yeah, if you force it to, in a sense, you're forcing it to make a choice. So it has to choose. It can't be both at you're once You're forcing the, the photon to make a choice? <laughs> you, you, you force it to have to take one path instead of both. Uh, this is... Does this make sense? We all good here? You all good? You understand it all? <laughs> I'm a biologist. <laughs> <laughs> so anybody have a question for her about this? Or <laughs> it makes no sense to me. Yes, sir. Wait, um, there's Sasha right there. In a broader sense, do we make our own reality by looking at something? Well, that, yeah. I mean, it, in a neurobiological perspective, yes. What? You, you, you only, the reality is whatever you make it in your brain. There is no, for example, there is no color out there. The, the dress has no color. Your brain assigns color to it. Which makes no sense to Wait, Hang on one second. Which, which makes no sense what? To other people. It, it makes no sense to other people. Um, at, this, at the same moment, if you make color to yourself, then other people will not see it the same way as you are. There's, oh, if everything is inside there's, your zero, head. there's zero evidence that two people see the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> two people have the same experiences. There's a great um, essay by Thomas Nagel called How It Feels to Be a Bat. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he starts out by trying to imagine what it feels like to be a bat. And, and you know what you realize after a moment is that you can't feel what it is to be another different person. And I would even go farther from a neurobiological perspective. I don't think you can tell how it felt to be you yesterday. So at that point, are you at the Hindu thing of nothing is real and it's all Maya? It's all an illusion? <laughs> I don't know anything about uh, Hinduism, but, it, but the reality that you create is not a, an accurate representation of the physical world. So we are not tape recorders or, um, or cameras. Uh, what we create is actually really good for one thing, survival. So it's really good for evolution. It's good enough to get us to, to today. And it's been good enough for all the different extant animal species to get them to today. Um, but it's not an accurate representation. Well, can I say that because our, part of it is that the, the, the forces fool our senses. There, was that business about Eddington's? Are there Eddington's two tables? Oh, I'm not familiar with this. About the, the table, the, the two tables, the table of nature and the table of physics. The table of nature is solid and hard. Oh, right. And. And the table of physics. Well, continue with your story, and then. Well, the table, the table, the table of physics. Yeah. Eddington said, "Table of physics is solid and hard, yeah. and then what if I burn it? It's turned into something different." But the table of physics is a cloud. Oh, sure. And it has no. It's mostly empty space. And if I burn it, it doesn't change. It's still the same thing. Ninety-nine point nine 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 or more percent of us is empty space. Right. So. Yeah, see, this is what I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> we feel solid. This is solid, but. There's so much empty space there. So why does it feel so like, well, I, this goes off, but to your point about we, we, are, 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 we make our own realities and our, our senses fool us. We're, these, these, these electromagnetic things make it seem solid because we can't go through sure. it. Sure. Um, I, I had a professor in college who would always, a philosophy professor, who would always talk about that 
what is it like to be a vet? What are you like? And then he would also talk about, how do you know you're not a brain in a jar? That, <laughs> so brain in a vat is another really fun um, fantasy or, or conundrum to think about. How, how, how would you feel if you were a brain in a vat? Um, what would be different from how you are as, as a person? Um, yeah. So let me, so I really, you guys are really great. I, I don't want to keep our guests too long because we have to, they have to get back to Hyde Park. But one of the things that has really fascinated me about this topic since my dear beloved Peggy brought it up is this notion of quantum biology. Because as I understand biology, it generally thinks about the world in a very classical kind of way. When we talk about the electron transport chain in, in mitochondria, which is how we make the magical firecrackers, we, we describe the electrons in terms of being discrete particles. And they have these discrete paths and they're passed along this electron chain. But we know That's how for- we teach it more than it is. Well, we, I mean, okay, because okay. because it, even in biology, I mean, we're not physicists, but but even in biology, everything is a probability. Oh, everything's a probability. So you know, the the channel opens or the channel closes. What that means is now there's a a chance the channel will open. The chance that the channel will open has shifted from X percent to Y percent. Now, when you say probability, that's what you're talking about in quantum mechanics, right? That it's all probability, that there are, what does, it, what does it mean about probability in quantum mechanics? Um, well, yeah, uh, quantum mechanics is built a lot on probabilities. <clears throat> like, for instance, um, when we were talking about the photon possibly going, being able to go through, like, sort of both paths at the same time, um, we can describe photons uh, through a, a, a terminology called a superposition. And these photons, have uh, a particular path, a mini number of infinite kind of paths that they can choose, and they all have some probability associated with the fact that they could choose one path or the other. So all of these things have sort of probabilistic effects, yeah. especially at quantum levels attached with them. So the particle could be in a million different places at one time, and you could describe <laughs> it by adding up a bunch of different probabilities for different possibilities of where it could be. Is that what you're saying? That, that, that's, I mean, that's, that's, what you that's absolutely true in biology too. It's just it's a lot a little easier to think about it as the <coughs> channel opens. But yeah. all that means is there's a population, and now the probability has has increased for X percentage of the population that are uh, responsive. So you don't tell your students that because that would make their brains explode. We we, we <laughs> it depends on what who which student it is. <laughs> what the course is. Yeah. But certainly the students learn that when they learn cellular sort of neurophysiology, yeah. And questions, 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 comments, uh, weirdnesses, things that seem strange that you'd love a little more light, little, a few more photons shed upon. <laughs> well, yes. Uh, you were talking about the shifting the... <clears throat> magnetic field, mm -hmm. right? So if the birds have the senses, does that mean if the pole will change their location, for example, it would be in the center of uh, Canada, for example, and the bird would land supposedly uh, come, let's put it, 200 miles before right. the center of that magnetic field of the true north. So does it mean if that shifted, it may land in Illinois, for example, instead, if you have that sense of magnetic field, so I, I mean, it's going to happen. I think that that, so what you're asking is, what if the magnetic sense is used for orientation, to, for, for essentially for migration? Yes. If it's used for hunting or for landing, it doesn't really matter where you are, as long as everyone's on the same path. And so that wouldn't make a difference. But if you're trying to find home or last year's home, then it could conceivably make a difference. And I have no idea how the animals adjust for that or if they do. I just don't know. And you know, and every once in a while we didn't we forgot to talk about this, but I I, I go down various rabbit holes and you know, I I'm not really down the quantum rabbit hole because it's way too complicated for me. But the, the magnetic north rabbit hole is very interesting, and occasionally it decides to flip. Mm. Yes. 
Yes. And that's cool. So when has that has that has happened in evolution? Because that's not that infrequent. Um, so the last time the Earth <clears throat> poles flipped was, I think, 780,000 years ago. Yeah, not so quite a million nothing, years ago. Nothing. <laughs> but but um, the Earth's when it flips its magnetic field is quite chaotic and it isn't predictable. So it's hard for us to say when it might flip again and if the fact that the pole is wandering right now, whether or not that means a flip is coming in the future, I don't know. I've been seeing a lot of articles about like, oh, the wandering pole means that the Earth is gonna flip its poles or that um, maybe in some places the magnetic field strength is decreasing. That happens over time as well. It's hard to say exactly when this polarity and, change might happen. And it's also, I haven't gotten a clear answer as to how long it takes to flip. Yeah, that, that is a hard question to answer. <laughs> I think it's not clear. Um, I, I guess, I think you can get some information about this by looking at like rock yeah. cores and ice cores, because the rocks, um, the, the particles in the rock will line up with the direction that the Earth's magnetic field is pointing. Also, particles of ice will do the same thing. So you can sort of see a, a layer like you can, like sediment and rocks, and it tells you some information about that. But I, I don't know if we can tell or how we can tell how fast it happens. Right, right, right. Yeah. And, and different, on different planets within our solar system, the orientation of magnetic north, because our, 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 the Earth's uh, magnetic north is not perpendicular to our orbit. But it's close. Uh-huh, yeah. But on different planets and other... Yeah, so if, if we want to talk about, this is just, yeah, it's a cool thing. Um, so here's our Earth. The Earth is tilted at about 23 degrees from vertical, and so it rotates around that way. And so then um, the red, uh, yeah, the red axis here is the axis of the magnetic field. And so you see on Earth, it's offset by about 11 degrees, that number here. On Saturn, the rotational axis and the magnetic axis align very well. And Jupiter, not offset by very much, but look at Uranus. Uranus is actually tilted on its side and rotating on its side, but its magnetic polarity is totally off, uh, off with respect to its axis and, and Neptune as well. So, you know, it's, it's a, a... So Uranus is, ro is rotating with its, the axis of rotation pointing at the sun, like it's a spoke on a, on a wheel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which I thought was... Super it's cool. weird, yeah. <laughs> And on that very weird note, how about a great, we thank our wonderful one, guest. One, 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 sorry, one way, another question, sorry, sorry about that. Yes, go ahead. Um, yes, I always see discussions of what point in the northern territories the magnetic pole for north is, but I never see one on where it is on the other side of the globe. Is there not a, a corresponding point that wanders around down there too? And if so, where is it and why don't we hear about it? On the south pole? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll just show, I do have another figure here. Just happens to have a slide. <laughs> so this is, there are a bunch of different ways you can map the Earth's magnetic field. Um, and so in red here is sort of like a north polarity, like a, a pole of, an, of, of, a, of a magnet, and then in blue is the south polarity. Um, and so in, in the northern hemisphere, the magnetic north is kind of somewhere, let's see, Somewhere up around here, it's actually not plotted on this map because it stops at 70 degrees. <laughs> but the South Pole is actually somewhere right around here, the South Magnetic Pole, um, sort of just off of Antarctica a little bit. And it, it, it can move and it does move a little bit um, over time, but I guess that's less, be, it does talked about less in the news, maybe. It's less apparent it to all of us. Less. Um, at the moment, at the moment, okay. maybe. <laughs> but in, in the past history, maybe not. It's just in the current stage, the current time that we're in now, it's the, the North Pole is wandering maybe a little bit more than the South Pole, although the South Pole still meanders as well. Um, yeah. So now I'm really confused. Yeah, as you as got as it! As if I wasn't before. <laughs> but I just assumed whenever I've heard about this wandering North Pole thing, magnetic pole, and when you talked about it, I've always assumed that at the other pole, it's doing the equal and opposite thing. Nope. <laughs> so this stuff isn't on an axis, like the magnetic North and South are not opposite each other? Not exactly opposite, oh, no. Oh, God. Okay. No. <laughs> 
No, it would be like very convenient and easy if it were, right? <laughs> no, and if, this is a fact of, of the fact that we have in the interior, the thing that's creating our Earth's magnetic field is this, again, this rotating molten liquid interior, and me metallic interior, and it rotates in different ways and different parts, and some parts of it have these big upwellings and some parts are moving a little bit more slowly, and all of these things together mean that the system isn't going to be exactly symmetrical around the equator. In fact, our sun has magnetic asymmetries in the northern and southern hemispheres that we see, um, and so our Earth does the same thing. Mm -hmm. Oh, Kristen? So, right here, a, right there? No, Anna. I oh, Anna, yeah, sorry. A question and a comment. So the question about the, the northern <coughs> hemisphere, isn't the ring of fire, the volcano, Thing more in the northern hemisphere, and would that, you know, with volcanoes erupting, would that um, have an influence on the movement of the North Pole? So Maybe that the North Pole? is beyond my area of expertise to really say much about. Uh, I don't know much about, um, you know, the 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 processes that happen in the upper crust or in the in the Earth's sort of upper layers, so I'm afraid I can't really say much, I, and especially I can't say much about how that might impact the magnetic field, so I'm sorry, I can't speak to that. Do you know anything about that? Her guesses sounds Wait, good to me. Hang on, this is, this is about <laughs> Bill, Bill Higgins, who's a physicist at Fermilab, a good buddy of mine, Mr. Uh, Beam Jockey on Twitter. Uh, you you want to talk to somebody that really knows <laughs> you know, physics and crustal plates and that kind of stuff, but Volcanoes and earthquakes are a phenomenon of the, I don't know what, the top 100 miles of the Earth's crust. And that's way above the kind of phenomena that you've been talking about here. Uh, I wanted to mention something about the, uh, the offset of the magnetic pole, it's, or the magnetic field is not centered at the center of the Earth, which you were speaking of just a few, a minute ago. The one consequence of that is it's, uh, it's a little closer to the surface on one side than on the other side. And one of the things that follows the magnetic field is the donut of radiation particles circling the Earth, the Van Allen radiation belts. And so because of the, this magnetic asymmetry, there is a, a thing called the South, Ma South Atlantic anomaly where in the, the, the radiation belt is closest to the Earth over the South Atlantic. And, and when satellites circling somewhere near the equator or you know, the first 20 or 30 degrees above, above or below the equator, when those kind of satellites come through over the South Atlantic, that's when they see the most radiation in the low orbit. Mostly they're below, the satellites I'm talking about are below the orbit, of, uh, below the bottom of the, of the radiation belts, but there's, but they, they it skirt them skirt around the South Atlantic, and uh, if your spacecraft is taking scientific measurements, or maybe the Hubble telescope is trying to take a picture or something like that, you kind of got to watch out for that when you're operating the spacecraft, because uh, it's one of the many boogeymen that could, uh, that could give your spacecraft trouble. Thank you, Bill. And Kristen? My question is completely unrelated to, well, mostly unrelated. My brain got uh, sidetracked at the very beginning of the talk. We were talking about something having to do with magnetism residing in the immune system or immune cells. Oh, 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 no. The, these, um, these deposits, deposits of iron that are on a bird's beak, they are in, so th they were thought to be the sensor yeah. of, of magnetic north, but to do that they would have to be sensory cells that actually made their way somehow to the nervous system and it turns out that they're actually immune cells. So why do they have fi uh, iron? I have no idea. Is that true in humans also? Is no, no, no. This is a thing on, on the little beak, oh, just of, the, on the beak. of the bird, yeah. It's okay. a very special um, structure. We have cryptochromes okay. in our retinas, but no iron in our beaks. <laughs> <laughs> Dog got it! <laughs> Wait, okay, one more. <laughs> and I see how, how, about, how about the iron in our blood? How about what? The iron in our blood, hemoglobin. 
Yeah, uh, you know, it has to be, to, to sense an orientation, it has to be fixed. So there's also an, an inner ear structure in, um, what is this in? It's, it's called the canal of, Lor the ampullae of Lorenzini. And it's in sharks and sharks and stingrays. And it senses electric fields, and because it senses electric fields, it can sense, you know, by Faraday's law, it can also sense a magnetic field. Um, and so that has, you, you know, that exists in them, and, and the, I saw a speculation that that could also uh, be a sensor in, in the, hu the human or vertebrate uh, semicircular canals could do a similar thing. I, I have no idea if that has any reality or not. Okay. Yeah. So this is part of my comment. Um, it is an eighth nerve derived uh, organ, the ampulla of Lorenzini. Um, my comment was going to be that in birds, but not in mammals and other animals, their hair cells, their detectors of gravity, have in their cuticular plate, the top part, an iron-rich organelle. And it's thought that that perhaps can detect magnetic fields and possibly have to do with migrating birds. I don't know if, I don't, it hasn't been described in like whales, which migrate for long distance, but definitely in birds. So in birds, but not in mammals? Right. Or fish or frogs or anything. And is it, is it all the hair cells or is it the hair cells of the sacculus or? Um, pretty much all the hair cells, I, I have a reference for that. Yeah, cool. That would be Dr. Anna Lissakowski, who's the president of the Chicago chapter of the Society for Neuroscience, Chicago NSF, NSF SFN, Chicago SFN <laughs> dot org. And, and a great vestibular neuroscientist. And a great vestibular neuroscientist and a, a great gum manufacturer. <laughs> she does, she makes gum. Okay, I have a question for Maria. It's just rolling back when you were describing the experiment when photon supposedly is forced to choose when we put the detector. Is it the illustration of Heidelberg principle? Uh, the Heisenberg... Uh, because you're changing the momentum when you start detecting. Uh, so, yeah, so the uncertainty principle is the fact that you can't know how fast something is moving and its position at the same time. Um, so I'm... I, I, I don't really know how this relates, I guess. Uh, maybe someone else in the room might be able to speak. Well, to the extent that the that, act of ob observing changes the phenomenon. Yeah, it's, it's certainly so it's, that the, the act of observing changes, but the, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is the fact that you can't know a, a position and a speed at the same time. So. It also, because one of the weird things about the, uh, this particular two slit thing, that the measurement occurs after it has already gone through the slits. So in theory, uh, you could still you know, as much know, know as much as you needed to know about its position or its velocity, but what's weird about it is that the observation after its choice has been made changes. That the consequences of the choice change after the choice has been made. And that's what's doo -doo -doo -doo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, thank you guys so much. But so let me just say that you can, uh, Dr. Weber, you're on Twitter at Solaris Maria. Solaris, because I'm a solar physicist, so Solaris Maria. And you are on Twitter as? Neuromook. Neuromook. <laughs> and her blog is? Thebrainisocool.com. You got a blog? No, you're on Instagram, though. You're on Instagram. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Yes. Uh, on Instagram, I'm Dr. Solaris Maria. <laughs> <laughs> and we're the Chicago Brain Buddies, and we are uh, and C2ST.org is your source for public information about sciences across the spectrum of scientific disciplines. And we thank you guys all very much. Thank our guests. And you all, thank you very much. It's been lots of fun.